All right, let's get started. Welcome everyone uh, to this webinar. We are very excited uh, to discuss this topic. Um, some logistics, this webinar um, is being recorded and will be distributed to all registrants. We'll be monitoring the chat for any questions or tech issues. And we'll leave about 10 minutes at the end uh, for your questions. Um, we are going to ask that you keep your audio muted until the Q&A. You may also drop questions throughout the presentation in the chat. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and have our awesome panelists uh, introduce themselves. Uh, so to start us off, uh, Trevor. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here. Um, and Trevor Toti, I have been teaching uh, high school social studies for seven years in Houston, Texas at A. Leaf Taylor High School. Um, taught a variety of subjects in social studies from world history, economics, government, um, AP US history, and academic decathlon. Um, currently pursuing a master's of public policy at the Hobby School of Public Policy um, at the University of Houston um, in hopes to pursue a career in education policy. Thanks so much, Trevor. Tori. Everyone, my name is Tori Trust. I'm Associate Professor of Learning Technology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I'm a coordinator of the Learning Media Technology Master's Program and the Digital Media Design and Making an Education Graduate Online Certificate Program. And I teach a mix of undergrad and graduate courses about teaching and learning with technology. Fantastic, thank you. Megan. Everyone, I'm Megan Whitaker. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the National Center for Learning Disabilities. And NCLD is a national nonprofit um, that works to empower and improve the lives of individuals who have learning and attention issues. So in my role, I coordinate our federal advocacy, working with coalitions, with Congress and the administration. Um, and our goals are to protect the civil rights of students with disabilities and to increase access and opportunities for them both in school and beyond. All righty, and last but not least, my colleague, Juliana. Thanks, Amelia. Hi, everyone. My name is Juliana Cotto. I'm policy counsel on the Youth and Education Privacy Team at the Future Privacy Forum. Um, a lot of the work that I work on is student privacy and building out resources and training specifically for educators. I am a former educator, so I used to teach at Chicago Public Schools and St. Louis Public Schools. Wonderful. All right. Well, it's time for you to see the faces of our wonderful panelists and for us to dig right into the discussion today. So uh, let's start um, maybe with Tori on this question and then Trevor. When your classrooms first transitioned to virtual, what led to your decision to allow video on to be optional for your students? Well, for one thing, I always want to give my students choice. And we were, you know, in a really unique situation of being thrown into the online world. As much as I talk about teaching and learning with technology and the classes I was teaching last spring uh, 2020 were blended. So students were familiar with doing asynchronous work at home. Um, having to show up on Zoom once a week uh, was different. And I noticed uh, some students joining in from their storage closets um, in their homes, graduate students. And they just, um, either they lived in a rural area or they didn't have good access to internet. And the only place in the entire house that had access to internet that was like good enough for Zoom uh, was like a storage closet. Um, so, so that, you know, I always try to bring choice into my class, but I also did a, um, a check-in survey and I sent out a quick Google form of, you know, what technology do you have access to? What um, is your internet reliable? Um, just to be able to see whether I should be hosting Zoom classes. Um, and I gave it a go for one class and the other class I ended up moving mostly asynchronous because um, it was too hard for too many students to be able to access class due to internet issues or device access. So um, definitely it was all about choice and, and uh, privacy and safety for my students at that time. Great, and Trevor. All right, so I was very similar. Um, just kind of being thrown into this situation. Um, our district um, in the spring 
uh, last year kind of had us send out surveys too about what kind of access our students had. And having known my district's demographics already, I think that was the biggest driving force behind uh, my decision to make it optional. Um, my district is very diverse. We're about, uh, there's over like 90 different languages spoken in our district. Um, we're about 80% economically disadvantaged. Um, we have, if I have this open right now, 83% oh yeah, economically disadvantaged, 83% um, considered at risk, um, according to TEA. And just taking that into account with my years of experience with my students and the, the cultural differences, that's one big thing is we have a lot of families that are multi-generational. Um, there's numerous family members. You know, I have some kids that in small apartments are with, you know, four, five, six, even seven members of family, um, grandma, all the way down to brothers, sisters, cousins, whatever. And that was kind of that, that same thing that Tori mentioned is gathering that information and determining like, this isn't beneficial to force you guys to, to do this. Um, especially for my students, we never had one-to-one -one or any experience with that in our district. So doing these massive distributions of laptops and hotspots and all of that, it took time for them to even get comfortable with that technology. Um, and again, I agree with the choice. I always like giving my students choices, even when it comes to just typical assignments we do in class. Um, but I'd say that the demographics were the best thing, just knowing what my kids are like, their district, the, the things that they face every day. I was a pretty big advocate for, no, we should not force cameras to be on. Um, in this time, yeah, you know, those when they get comfortable doing it, they turn them on, and that's one thing I notice a lot with them. So, great. So, Megan, uh, want to start with you on this question. What are your main concerns, NCLD's main concerns, when it comes to uh, having video mandates? Sure. Um, well, so two main concerns come to mind for me. And first, you know, of course, blanket rules like this can have unintended consequences for certain, certain groups of students. We wanna remain kind of vigilant about monitoring those. And if you think about the needs of students with disabilities, they have individualized education programs, IEPs or 504 plans that are designed just for them. They receive accommodations, they might have scheduled breaks, um, they might need to get up, move around, fidget, or kind of follow a routine that's different from other students. And so there are students spending most of their time with general education teachers. And even though you know, educators working with those students should be familiar with their IEP and know about their accommodations, the reality is that many general educators don't necessarily know how to accommodate those students. So you can, lead it, you can see it kind of leading to a situation where a student gets up or a student needs to take a break, but they're required to have their camera on and it can lead to that student kind of being called out, being denied their accommodations if they're asked to get back in front of their camera. Um, and it can also lead to discipline for being off camera when they're not supposed to. Um, so I think it's important to think about the individual needs of students and these kinds of blanket mandates can, can cause some issues in terms of the civil rights of students with disabilities. Um, and that leads me to kind of to the con second concern that comes to mind, which is disproportionate discipline. We know that students with disabilities and students of color have always experienced higher rates of discipline and received harsher punishment um, than their non-disabled or their white peers for the very same behaviors. But now we're in uncharted territory in virtual schooling. Um, we've heard of situations where um, teachers don't like how a student's participating in class or how they're acting on camera. And those students are kicked out of the virtual classroom. They're sent to a separate breakout room. They have their cameras turned off. Um, and so it's th their virtual education lends itself to a whole new form of exclusionary discipline that we need to be mindful of. Um, and we've also seen situations where students break rules that would apply to in-person settings, but don't actually pose any risk to other students when we're all in our own home. So one kind of um, extreme example, you know, a teacher saw a gun in the background of a student's home because that student was on camera. So should those same rules apply because you can't have guns at school? Um, should that student be disciplined? Um, and so those are the things that, that we're seeing happen and the dangers of requiring students to be on camera at all times, specifically when we don't really have uniform policies about how to handle behavior and discipline in this very new setting. So I think you know, we need to see some flexibility to allow for us to navigate these, this new territory. Great. Um, Juliana, uh, what do you see as some concerns here when it comes to video mandates? 
Absolutely. So I'm going to touch on two that that come to mind. So I think part of the aim with video mandates is to try to replicate an in-person setting as much as possible. Um, but I think it's important to remember like the student perspective versus a teacher perspective in an in-person classroom. So for a teacher, typically when they're standing in front of the class, they get to see all the faces of their beautiful students. But unless a student is giving a presentation, they would never have that perspective of seeing all of their students or maybe raising their hand and causing all their peers to look at them. And I can't really think of a scenario, you know, in person where a student would be staring kind of at their own face. So, so requiring students to have their camera on, it really is putting them in a brand new situation where they're more conscious, conscious of their appearance, of their behaviors, of answering your questions, of making a mistake. Um, and it can feel, it can make students feel just much more surveilled. Um, and then as Tori and Trevor were alluded to as well, we're, we're asking students to share parts of their private lives that previously educators and peers did not have access to. So again, what type of a living you know, environment are you in? Who lives in your home? What does your family makeup look like? How stable is your home environment? Do you have a different background week to week? Um, the second concern I have is the assumption that's being made about the benefit of video mandates. So we're assuming that, you know, we're asking students to have their cameras on to make sure that they're participating and that they're engaged and they're not off task or to give them that type of social interaction with their peers. So being able to, to see their peers and their peers see them. Um, but we do have to think about those quote unquote extreme cases. And I say quote unquote, because a lot of the times those extreme cases are a lot more common than we might think. So again, you know, think about the case where a student is experiencing homelessness um, does ask, does requiring them to have their camera on, you know, is, does that harm actually outweigh that benefit? Are they able to engage socially and get that social benefit when in actuality, they may just be really, really embarrassed and worried about what their peers, what their peers are seeing. Um, so again, just thinking about, you know, how does that perceived benefit and those risks change depending on those different scenarios and cases? Great. Absolutely. Um, Tori, anything to add here? Yeah, I, I agree with what everyone said before. There's there's a lot of concerns around video mandates, um, especially when schools or districts make the mandates and then teachers become the ones who um, have to then force or coerce students to turn their cameras on because of those mandates. Um, but one thing I, I wanted to add to this is, uh, quite frankly, there is no training for teachers or students or their families for how to be on Zoom or Google Meet or a video conferencing call. And I just remember when we uh, switched to online in my graduate class, uh, I quickly figured out how to do the virtual background. And a lot of my students I could see playing around and it was the early days where their computer, some of their computers wouldn't um, work with the Zoom requirements. So they would like go invisible into the background but they really wanted to have the cool background. And it's, it's like simple things like that we hadn't taught um, students how to set up a virtual background to make, you know, their safe, uh, their space a little bit safer for what they were showing on camera. We didn't teach them how to, you know, present themselves on camera, not that they have to like get up and dress professionally for school, but just like understanding what it means to be on camera. And the same, I know a lot of teachers were like, I don't like being on camera. Um, and then families haven't been trained in terms of if their kids on like, you know, maybe you shouldn't be saying things in the background or doing things in the background, or you may not like really think about because it's your home and you just do what you do at home. Uh, but I think moving forward, teacher preparation programs, absolutely, um, and schools and districts need to think about how do we prepare students, families, and teachers for um, safe and equitable engagement in these spaces. And, and there are things like, um, you know, cyberbullying that still happens. Like you could take, someone could take a screenshot of me in the middle of like eating right now um, that wouldn't happen in school because they probably wouldn't pull out their phone in the middle of class and take a picture of someone eating. So there's there's like, we we need to focus on the, the, the professional learning opportunities first um, and to counteract um, some of the things that can happen that quite frankly, people weren't uh, really prepared for. And so, um, I'm glad more people are getting more comfortable and, and learning along the way, but I wish we hadn't had all these um, extra issues related to, you know, cyberbullying or safety or equity or um, violations of privacy um, that had to come about before we realized 
that probably was not the best approach. I think that brings in a really important point, which is, you know, having video on doesn't, you know, make anyone a bad teacher, that there are a lot of really important reasons why um, many schools, many educators have chosen to have video on and benefits that they've seen there. Uh, what are some of those benefits um, and what are other ways perhaps to achieve those benefits? Maybe um, Trevor, if you wanna start and then we can go to Megan. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest benefits for me as a teacher that I've noticed with them camera on is body language. Is, you know, even in person when I'm presenting stuff, cause I do teach AP US history for a lot of my students. Um, I don't wanna say they're not ready for that class but it comes to a shock of them a lot of times um, when they get to this class, like you want me to do what? So when I'm lecturing in person, they might not want in front of everybody to voice like, I don't know what's happening, but you can read the body language, you know, whether it's a small like facial expression or something, I can kind of look around the room and judge that and be like, okay, well, I need to go a little further here. So with cameras on, I can get that same type of feedback, right? Um, when I'm going over something, I look at a face and they're like, what? I can be like, okay, let me slow down. I can react um, accordingly. Um, and that's been kind of gone, you know, for the most part. Um, but I do understand that I just have to be more conscious than uh, literally verbalizing like, hey guys, if you don't understand something make sure you use your reaction, right? Or slow down, raise your hand, which is something that I have had to adjust to. Because like I said, the benefit is that usually it's on the fly. It's just, I can kind of scan the room be like, okay, we get it, we don't get it. Um, and that's what I really miss the most, honestly, is being able to, to interject when I know that they're not understanding. Yeah, I would, I would just add, I think Trevor, you're kind of exhibiting things that great teachers do. Um, and I think, you know, the research is, is not great on entirely virtual or online programming for students with disabilities. They typically don't have a lot of benefit for students with disabilities. So I think the goal of, of virtual learning where you can use cameras is to kind of get it as close to in-person instruction as you can. And it's hard, um, but I think that the benefit of having videos on is that educators can see how students engage are engaging. They can pick up on some more of those cues that might signal when a student's not following the content or might need additional support. Without cameras, I think it can be really hard to assess because it requires you to have a student who's comfortable speaking up or have a student who's comfortable reaching out to you directly or waiting until there's some sort of assessment to tell you that the, the student was missing what you were aiming for all along. So I think that that's a really important benefit here and making sure teachers know how to read the room in a virtual setting. And that's a skill, like um, Tori said, isn't hasn't really been taught to our educators. Um, but a second thing to keep in mind here is that you know, students have had major disruptions in their lives since the pandemic began. And it's not just about academic instruction, but it's also about the social and emotional needs of students. There are models of social and emotional learning and whole child approaches that emphasize things like routines and relationships. And both of those things have been really significantly disrupted for, for the last year. Um, students don't have the same peer interactions. They've kind of lost out on some of the relationships that they've built with students, with adults, like their educators. So for some, having a camera on is actually the only connection that they may have to their school community right now. Um, and while it does, certainly doesn't replace, you know, the value of being in person in a school, um, those relationships are really critical to students' well-being. So that's the second benefit, I would say, to using cameras and connecting with others the best we can right now. Absolutely. Um, Tori, what about you? What have you seen? And then uh, what are other ways to achieve some of the benefits when, you know, a student doesn't want their video on um, for the many reasons we've talked about? Yeah, I agree with what's been said. And, and often we try to replicate our traditional practices, things we're familiar with. So scanning the room is like, how do you do that in a, in a virtual sense? Um, but it, it is possible. And actually what I'm hoping that um, this forced shift to emergency remote teaching and using digital tools has showcased there's other ways to um, evaluate and assess student learning and attention. Um, I just wanna share, I, start off, I started off my graduate and undergraduate classes this semester on the very first day and the very first slide saying, uh, you're not required to be on camera, but here are the benefits of being on camera. And I talk about um, the benefits of social learning, of um, interactions and of um, how it fosters community building. 
And then I go over specifics of if I'm doing a mini lecture, like I really, I'm fine. I don't need to see your faces. In some cases, I don't want to see them falling asleep while I talk, but that's, that's not too often. Um, although I do have late classes and I get a lot of this uh, later in the day and I'm like, I wish I hadn't uh, seen that. But, um, but I do encourage them. I'm like, when you get to the breakout rooms, because we do design-based learning, like every 30 minutes in my class, we get to breakout rooms, they're doing projects. I'm like, it, it's hard when um, you can't see the other person just to establish that relationship. So I'm like, if you're willing, you know, come on camera, it's totally up to you, um, foster that connection. And then you can go to your separate ways to work on the Google doc or design project um, where you don't have to see each other and come back because I've been working with two really brilliant educational researchers, Jeff Carpenter and Dan Kretka in different states for six years now. And we'll always come together on Google Meet, we'll talk about our research project, but then we'll spend like three hours on Google Docs working on it and we don't see each other, but we can still interact in a professional manner and write, you know, strong scholarly manuscripts. So um, I think encouraging students and, and telling them, you know, why you should be on camera, because I think um, there's a lot of fear of even just like talking about that in classes. It was just either you force them or you'd give them too much choice. And there was worries of like, you know, how do I navigate those boundaries? Um, but in addition to that, there's, you know, why do we need to see students on camera if it's just to um, get a quick assessment of how they're doing? Um, there's features within Zoom or Google Meet where they can do quick reactions like thumbs up, thumbs down. They can post in the text chat. I can tell you, I have 75 students in my class. That text chat is going off because I told them, I was like, I want you to build this community in this class. I want you to be sharing knowledge and showing you are active. Um, and so they are active in the text chat. Uh, we use a lot of um, design-based activities. So I'll do a mini lecture for 15, 20 minutes. They will go and design and then they come back and share like a meme they created or an infographic. And I can quickly tell if they were paying attention during the mini lecture or not. So I think there's, there's fears of if the eyes are not directly at you, then they're not learning. But I can tell you, I have been in a lot of faculty meetings where my eyes are looking on camera and I'm like writing a research paper in my head um, you know so so that is not necessarily saying if the eyes are on the camera that they are learning and that's the same in the traditional classroom even if students are taught to sit still and look forward it does not mean that they are learning so coming up with new ways to assess and we have so many digital tools whether it's a quick assessment like draw something on a jam board or do a quick Kahoot kit quiz to check in or it's something more in depth like project-based learning where they're showing their steps along the ways um, I think there's there's so many incredible tools out there. If teachers were to become more familiar with those, there would be less worry about um, attention and eye contact time and learning and more focus on, um, you know, how do we showcase their learning in different ways and, and keep that kind of same like constant check in to make sure that they're understanding what we're saying. So uh, I want to go outside the prepared questions because all of this is not gone entirely off the top of my head. I know you are all shocked, shocked to hear that. Um, and uh, bother Megan. Megan, as um, Tori and Trevor were talking, one thing that came to mind with me since we've worked a ton on some of the disability rights issues here is, you know, that idea of eye contact as a student being engaged obviously does not equal a student being engaged. And in some cases, particularly with students with some disabilities actually means that they're not engaged. Can you talk a little bit about um, that point specifically and what are some of the things there where, you know, a student may be fiddling with something, but that actually helps them learn? Yeah, so there's, and it certainly depends on the age of students as well. I mean, I focus on, you know, K-12 education, but for young students, regardless of whether they have a disability, you may see them you know, fiddling or moving around. And that's just the nature of young children. So I think that's really important to remember. Um, and for, for older students who do have, you know, the could be a processing issue, could be an attention issue, whatever it may be, fidgets can actually help them focus and help them, you know, use up some of that energy that they have so that they are learning a little bit more effectively. And it's important to remember every student learns differently. So what I'm doing to, I could be doodling, I could be listening, but not looking. And that's just how I learn. Um, it's important for educators to, to understand that. And I think whether that's in person or in virtual settings, it, that same thing applies. And so I think there's kind of a big question here of, um, 
have educators talk with parents about how their child learns what they might need. I think it's important to have check-ins with parents on a regular basis to say, what am I missing as an educator if I can't see your child? Or even if I do, you see them at home in an entirely new context now. So how do I take what you're seeing and make sure I'm incorporating it into how I support that student? And it's also um, important to be mindful that you know what works for one kid doesn't work for all. And that some of these rules we put in place could actually limit the ability of a student to actually access and engage in their learning. And um, you know, I, I don't wanna talk about legal issues, but kids are entitled to FAPE, free appropriate public education. And so how do you as an IEP team or as a team of educators think about what does this specific child need and are the rules and practices I'm using preventing them from actually engaging in the way that they need to to get that education? Absolutely. Um, Trevor, I want to come back to you. You started talking about some of these alternative ways um, to see if students are engaged um, within, you know, giving the reactions, all of that. What are some other uh, strategies that you've used uh, when students don't have their videos on? Um, so for me, uh, especially my district is now hybrid. We were started the year fully like online and I was actually at home, which was way easier for me. Um, to use the features because I was directly at home. So in between classes, I could quickly type up Zoom polls because those of you that have used the Zoom polls, they don't, you know, you can't copy them to another meeting that you have. They're not really intuitive. You have to, it takes time to create them, especially numerous ones in a class. So that was something that worked very well is with my lesson planning on the weekends, I would, you know, obviously pre-write questions and have those in there because as I realized kids weren't having their cameras on, that was a quick, easy way to see like, you guys understand what I just went through. Um, the other things that um, I've used is, and I know we get into using secondary apps and data collection and stuff, but Flipgrid um, is one that I use a lot, especially for like my academic decathlon kids who had to give speeches. And like, when we're in person, they have to give speeches, you just get up in front of the class. Um, and Flipgrid was a lifesaver because they didn't have to do it on Zoom right there at 7.20 in the morning because that was my academic decathlon class. They had, they had the ability to, you know, when they were comfortable, find a space for them and then film their speech and then everyone else could view it too. And I almost think that prepared them a little more because they weren't just speaking to the audience that was the class, but they were speaking to anyone who went on to, to, to look at that speech. Um, so the Zoom polling, um, other apps that we've used, um, my school uses Schoology, so I use a ton of those Google assignments because I can monitor, so I can have a Google Slides with my slides or have them do primary source analysis, and I can monitor directly what they're saying and kind of step in. I had a nice little kind of reflection today, a silver linings reflection, and it was in Google assignments on Schoology, and I was just telling kids going through, like, type into them, like, hey, I noticed you haven't opened it yet, you know, let's get going, and then they type back, like, oh, I just had to go somewhere real quick. I'm like, okay. Just make sure we get it done. So there is a lot of options available. The issue that we run into is the planning portion, in my opinion, and like the time it takes to like set that up. And my district this summer, I mean, I, they're doing a great job in my opinion, but this summer, everyone kind of like, what are we doing? So I couldn't plan accordingly. And then when the school year started, it was a lot of late nights, um, a lot of weekends, a lot of Sundays, kind of trying to get that um, prepped for them. But there are options available to us educators to ensure there's engagement outside of just looking at, at the screens for sure. Great. So it's uh, been difficult, as Megan, you alluded to, for schools and educators to take school policies that were created for an in-person setting and translate them into virtual. I know, I think my favorite was that people had to wear real shoes and not slippers. Uh, but uh, for example, there's also, you know, tracking and assessing student participation and behavior. Um, what are some things that schools and educators should be cautious of? Um, so Juliana, maybe if you want to start here and then um, have Megan uh, weigh in as well. Absolutely. So I think one thing that schools should be cautious of is over interpreting data. So does this mean what I'm saying it means? Um, so for example, you know, if a student has their video off, am I saying they're absent? And um, am I translating that to a poor participation or engagement um, grade? 
and you know even the number of minutes that's spent in like the school learning management system is that an accurate reflection of how hard they've been working on the assignment especially you know because it can depend on what tech what type of device or technology they're using to access that lms so not assigning qualities to data especially tying it to, to something like grades you know which has a large impact on students um, but maybe using it more as a reference point or starting point to a larger conversation um, and then another aspect that schools and educators should be cautious of is the, the over collection of data and also tied to like this, this is not in person, this is drastically different, even though we're trying to create to recreate that in person um, setting as much as possible. So I know Megan, you brought in a big, an example, a story, I think it was from Baltimore where a student had, it was a toy gun in the background and even a toy gun um, was not allowed to be brought to school and would result in a suspension or expulsion and that student experienced similar similar disciplinary outcomes and it's like well is it the same no that student did not enter the school grounds right that student was in his home um, and so just really thinking about how those school policies translate um, i know as well as some teacher candidates in california were discussing how bandanas are not allowed to be worn at all in, in, in school. And so navigating, you know, they don't really have um, guidance on how to navigate that when their students show up in class with those bandanas on, because, you know, it's class. So they, 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 so I think, you know, guidance there on how, on how to, um, to go about that. But again, just remembering where we're accessing students, you know, private lives and just, just ac being accommodating for that. Yeah. And I, I, I totally agree with everything you're saying. I think we have to be really cautious when it comes to discipline and really think carefully about how to apply the policies that we've used in our schools and whether they even should be applied in virtual settings. Um, and the second thing that I, I think um, goes directly to what Juliana was just saying is that none of this data should be used to make a, a single decision, right? You can't use one indicator um, to track a student or to make judgments about how they're doing, whether they're participating. Um, and I, so I think it's important for educators to be really focusing on the whole context for any student. Um, you know, looking at whether their camera's on or off or how much time they're spending shouldn't make a determination about whether they're participating or what their engagement is. We need to have progress monitoring. So you can see not only how are they comparing to other students, because if they are falling behind, we need to know that, but also are they growing over time? The same kids um, that might, they may, might make progress at different points of the year based on the kind of content they're being exposed to. And so you have to compare to a, a many different kind of factors and, and other students as well as their own growth. Um, so using formative assessments, using progress monitoring is really important. And then I think the third thing is um, they, there needs to be regular communication with families to make sure that families are sharing their observations, that families are expressing the challenges that they see their child encountering at home, as well as the successes. There may be things that a student has accomplished that the teacher has no idea about because it's not what you're tracking or what you're measuring. And it's really important to celebrate those and learn how to build on those so that that student can continue to grow and learn. Um, but I think for me, the major caution is it would be like an incomplete picture if we were just looking at participation and camera usage or behavior to make decisions about whether a student's learning right now, because there are so many other factors we need to be thinking about and people we need to be talking to to really get the full picture. Great. Uh, Tori, anything to add? Yeah, in my instructional design classes, I use the ADDI model, which is analysis, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. I love that model. And specifically, because it starts with analysis. And the reason we do analysis is so that you don't make assumptions. And I've just seen so many assumptions in the past year of, like I mentioned earlier, eyes on camera means you're paying attention or um, camera off means they're absent. Uh, so I just wanted to put a reminder in there is that um, it can be helpful for our teachers, schools and districts to be analyzing potential assumptions that we're making about students and how that's influencing their learning um, students of color, um, disabled students, you know, learn in different ways and have different needs. Um, and if you're if you're making assumptions about this kind of average student, like there there is no average, so then you're not really helping anyone. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Is the the more we can analyze and break down those assumptions and and really just get to know students and their families and and understand where they're coming from, the better the learning experience will be for all. Trevor, what do you have to add on this? I just kind of wanted to add a little bit about like uh, 
just how this whole the the pandemic in this online environment um it has kind of shown even more so the the problems or i guess difficulties that teachers have um with communicating with certain groups of like families like i know my my district is very diverse we have a lot of families uh, single parent homes moms that are nurses that actually you know when the pandemic have been working a tremendous amount so um, I even think that one benefit that could be used in this um, virtual world is, is getting parents involved in the virtual settings too. like being able to communicate. I've used Google Voice and texted more parents this semester than I have ever in my life. And I've been able to effectively communicate with them using Google Voice and just texting with a, a fake number. Right. So they don't have. Yeah. And it's been a, it's been a lifesaver. I don't know why I didn't do it in the past, but that's one thing I think of, even though it has been difficult, because when I think about calling parents, one of our requirements as a district is to call parents if they if they don't pass a test or fail a major grade um and depending on the test sometimes i could have you know 20 total kids and at the end of your day you're like man 20 parents to call today i mean yeah so like there's even benefits using this technology that can kind of help bridge that gap between school family um to help those students also in the learning environment Fantastic. And that's a, a perfect um, segue to our next topic, which, you know, I'll pick on Juliana first, um, since you guys may not know the answer, which is, so why are we holding this webinar now? We're doing this, you know, when we've been doing video for a while, but what are the aspects of this that are going to carry through? We know we all you know, really want to be back in, in person in many ways, but there's still some time to go. But what are some of the lessons that can carry forward here? So maybe first, um, Juliana, um, and then we'll toss it to Tori. Sure. So I think uh, maybe two lessons or yeah, lessons learned. And one, I think we have more widespread agreement about the need to address the gap in internet and um, device access. So while some schools were able to transition relatively very easily to remote learning, other school districts are still passing out learning packets. And I would say almost all districts are struggling with finding those missing students. Um, so hopefully continuing to see movement and progress on that. And then I think the second important lesson here well, I guess going back to going back to the first so also you know schools were able to try to quickly roll out one to one device programs I think um, Trevor you you mentioned this so trying to roll out quickly that infrastructure so that that technology and the role of technology in education is definitely here to stay and should only be improved hopefully and, and again in terms of um, that gap that's there um, and then secondly I think an important lesson to take away is you know, raising awareness on privacy. So privacy can commonly be misunderstood as something you're trying to hide. Um, Amelia always talks about this and something that I've always like held on to because I'm like, oh yeah, that's how I used to think about privacy. Um, but it's not, right? Privacy is about the right to control, you know, your information who has access to it and that flow of information. And then it's also incredibly contextual. So maybe I'm comfortable sharing this piece of information right now, but at a later time and day, different location to a different person, I'm not comfortable sharing that information. And so this connects to the school context because, you know, with video mandates, it's not just a classroom practice question. It's not just about pedagogy or academic or social benefit, right? There's a privacy and equity implication to that. And so, you know, in these classroom practices, school policies, trying to add that layer onto it to make sure we're thinking about that. Um, and to give an example, so, you know, of, of the context and how to think about classroom um, policies. So a lot of teachers have been recording classes to allow for asynchronous learning. So say, for example, there's an English course where students are reading an essay on a personal challenge they've overcome. Um, if we try to think about the benefit and the risk here, you know, there's, there might not be a great benefit um, to have to rewatching students share their essays. Um, you know, maybe you want to listen to other, other peers shared, but the risk can be pretty immense, right? When we think about, you know, what kind of information are students sharing in this? Is it, we're talking about a personal challenge, how sensitive or intimate or personal is it, right? So maybe in thinking about that privacy, risk to it, it might not be best practice to record that class, but with a different context. So maybe it's a math class where the educator is going over concepts for upcoming course. There's obvious 
um, benefit to that, right? Like students will want to rewatch that and to learn. So maybe as an educator, I'm gonna move forward and yes, record that class and make it accessible. I, I can jump in here as well, just thinking about, you know, what do we hope is here to stay from virtual learning? I think there's certainly still um, more to do to make sure it's accessible for everyone, but I certainly hope that a lot of what we've learned sticks with us. Um, I think there are things we shouldn't lose as we move forward. Um, first, I think, you know, there's some students with disabilities who've really excelled in this setting, and not all of them, of course, but there are examples of students with social anxiety or processing issues who've really benefited from learning at home without the pressures of school every day, without lots of social engagement or other distractions. Um, and so for those students, I'm hoping that we can be more flexible in how we reach them and how we let them learn and the kinds of learning settings we offer to them, um, particularly if you know they have an IEP and we have to customize their learning. Well, maybe an in-home setting is better suited for certain students. And I really hope that for those who maybe have to leave school on a regular basis for medical conditions or otherwise can still have a way to stay connected and to learn because we now have explored the virtual world as an option. Um, and then the second thing that I think is really Im important for us to hold on to is um, the role of parents. Uh, so many parents have said to us that they've, they've taken on a whole new role in their child's learning right now. They've become observers. They've seen different parts of their child that they had never really understood before. And it's allowed them to become more involved in making decisions and collaborating with schools. And the second thing is that IEP meetings have been, I think, in many ways, way more engaging for parents. They don't have to drop everything and drive to a school and, and take time out of their day. They can hop on a Zoom call and the dynamic is very different too. You're not sitting across the table on different sides trying to argue things. Everyone is just in this virtual setting and they feel more empowered. And so there's been a big increase in family engagement. And as Trevor just said too, he's been speaking to more parents than ever before. So I think that that's a really great thing that's come out of this. And I hope we hold on to the many new ways we've found to communicate and partner with families um, to support students so that you know, we can really improve their learning. Great, Tori. Yeah, I wanted to echo what Juliana said about um, more awareness and empowerment around privacy and also discriminatory design in ed tech tools. Um, one thing I've seen in my um, undergrad grad mixed class of teaching and learning with technology and we explore how to find evaluate and use digital tools and apps for teaching and learning um, this semester. And each week I ask students to write one question they have about class related to the class topic. We have not gotten to the class about privacy, cost, and data. And every week students are asking, um, what do I need to know about privacy, cost, and data? And I'm like, it makes me really happy you're asking that wait till week five um, and six, and I have two whole weeks to cover that. Um, but but you know, there's students are speaking out around um, things that they don't feel safe, you know, like the, the exam proctoring or whether like using Zoom or, you know, at the, at the start of the pandemic, like 400 digital tools and apps offered free versions. And then that led to a lot of privacy policies being signed without looking at them and a lot of data, which in some cases was being used in um, uh, not ethical manners. And so there, there seems to be increasing awareness around privacy issues and people being like, you know, I want to take that back. I want to have my right to privacy. So uh, that, that makes me happy. And I think we need to keep that momentum rolling. Um, I also want to say that the, the pandemic has really illuminated and exacerbated critical issues in education, um, in society, um, and uh, teaching issues as well. And there's things like, I just off the top of my head, last week on Twitter saw that college professor berating the, the student who was deaf or hard of hearing about um, uh, not being able to do something in the class. I, I couldn't even watch it because there was like just, <laughs> and, and things like that are being caught on camera. Um, and I've seen things with um, students of color, uh, black students in particular, their parents overhearing the way the teachers treat them. And I think there needs to be a reckoning. It's time that we, you know, these things that happen in schools like, um, there needs to be more training about how to empathize and understand others and um, uh, create equitable learning experiences for all. And um, I think it's the, the pandemic and the shift to emergency remote teaching really um, shined a light on these critical issues. And we can't forget those. And just there's this constant push of, I just want to return to normal. 
I just wanna get back to normal. But right now what normal means is you go into a classroom where students are six feet apart, can't turn and talk to each other and face the board and are lectured at. Um, that's not a good approach to teaching. And I think what teachers are realizing is um, just because you have 30 students captive in a room, it doesn't mean they're learning. And then when they're online, they actually had to change their approaches. A lot of teachers I was seeing using like universal design for learning um, and shifting up, giving more choice, um, giving different opportunities, using new tools, um, where in the classroom, they might have just been comfortable with talking, then students fill out a worksheet. Uh, you can't do that online. Your students will drop out, they will disconnect. Um, and so I think, I think we're, I'm hoping that we're learning a lot from um, the discovery of, of these different aspects and critical issues and are able to move forward with creating more equitable and inclusive learning experiences for all um, and not just trying to return to this so-called normal, which I think is a false promise. Great. Um, Trevor, and then um, I think we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. So start teeing them up in chat if you have any or raise your hand and we'll unmute you during your question. But first, Trevor. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of piggyback off a little bit of what Megan said and Juliana said about that kind of the, the transitioning um, to this with and how difficult it was for some districts because of our lack of you know technology. And my district specifically just between, we started very early in August, uh, August 6th was our first day. Um, so just between August 6th and October 12th, we distributed uh, 24,000 devices um, and seven and a half thousand hotspots. Um, we held roughly three and a half thousand IEP and R meetings virtually. Um, we were able to have 17 and a half thousand counseling sessions and be able to get students more connected to um, their counselors. Um, but that was a pro that was a difficult process. That was, you know, early on when we were fully virtual, I had students that were letting me know, hey, we only have one device in the house. It's my sister's day. I'll be there tomorrow. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> you know, thanks for letting me know. But just some of the, some of the districts were able to transition very quickly. Some districts struggle with it. But what I'm hoping now is that I hope my district stays one-to-one -one almost because it does give more opportunity. If, if a student is gone for something that day, cool, hop on Zoom with me after school. I mean, there's there's so many options available now, and I'm glad that honestly that teachers, especially others in the district that were hesitant or other teachers in our school that were hesitant to use technology, they were literally shoved off the cliff like you have to now. And I think that's eventually going to be a greater benefit to create kind of equitable education for for students. Great. So your opportunity to ask questions. I certainly have plenty more uh, that I am excited to ask. And I'm also clicking on um, some of the awesome resources, especially yours, Tori. I just downloaded this chapter on teaching with digital tools and apps and some of the privacy stuff there. I'm very excited to read it. Uh, while we wait for questions, um, Megan, I know NCLD recently released a distance learning toolkit. Can you explain the purpose of that toolkit and the resources it includes? And we'll also put that in the chat as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so a couple of years ago, we did um, a big scan of, re of you know, literature on instruction and on mindsets of educators to really determine what are the evidence-based approaches that support students with disabilities in general education settings. And we distilled three mindsets and eight evidence-based strategies that we think are really essential to improving outcomes for students with disabilities. Um, and we had put forward a toolkit at that time to help school leaders implement um, these kinds of approaches in schools to how to change mindsets, how to get educators to, to learn these strategies. Um, and then COVID happened and we realized like there, how do you do this stuff in a virtual setting? Are they still the same practices that will work in virtual settings or they still matter? Um, and so we created the distance learning toolkit, um, which is designed directly for educators. And it walks you through those same practices um, to see how they can be applied in distance learning settings. So it includes things like universal design for learning with direct links to tools that will help you apply the principles of UDL to your classroom. It, it includes a whole set of strategies, um, activities you can work through and ways you can check your understanding to make sure you know how to apply those 
in virtual and remote um, teaching settings. So it's a really hands-on tool designed just for educators, because I think a lot of them are searching for practices right now to help them reach students that, that might be harder to reach. Fantastic. Um, so we have a question. Uh, to what degree has this issue wound up in the courtroom? What are the legal implications of camera mandates? And how might litigation affect webcam mandates moving forward? Um, this is a passion related question for me. So I will, but I will hold off on answering and I will kick it over to Megan first to talk about um, some of the special education um, issues that may came, come up that you referenced earlier. Yeah, I mean, actually, I think I think a lot of districts brace for more litigation, for more parents filing complaints in due process. And from the analyses we've seen out of researchers at different universities, um, complaints have not been any higher than they were in a typical year. I think um, there, there has been a lot of flexibility on both the parts of educators and parents to, to understand things look different right now and everyone's really doing the best they can. Um, but I'm not sure um, about litigation specifically related to camera mandates. I've really been focusing on special education services and the rights of students in that regard. So Amelia, I might bounce it back to you to, to weigh in there. Uh, my lawyer soul is jumping up and down. Um, so it, it's really interesting and something as with most legal issues that will probably be decided way down the road as opposed to this moment when it would be helpful to have guidance and information, um, which is why, you know, we've lean so hard into pushing out best practices, but uh, there's a few really interesting uh, litigation avenues that we've heard about from some advocacy groups. So um, there's a lot of questions about uh, the Fourth Amendment and how requiring someone who must go to school, must go to public school or some alternative, um, to have their camera on, does that constitute a search? of what courts have traditionally found to be our most sacred space, uh, our home where we get um, solitude and have you know all of these things happen. And, and because this isn't for just an isolated purpose, many students you know, are attending school for multiple hours over the course of the day, multiple days a week. Um, it's much more likely that you'd actually see a lawsuit like this about, sorry, my cat zoom bombing here, um, about this than about something like online proctoring, even though as we've seen from some outcry there, there are a lot of concerns about the potential invasiveness. Um, so I'm betting that we'll see some case go through the courts that has settled, you know, five years from now. Um, we, as far as I know, haven't seen any specifically introduced here. The Supreme Court has given schools a lot of latitude, but this is definitely unprecedented and as expressed, isn't necessarily something that absolutely has to happen, which is usually what the court looks at uh, when they're determining whether the school, you know, has enough reasonable suspicion to do a search. Does a video count as a search? All sorts of things that make my legal nerd heart go. So uh, any other questions? Feel free to put them in chat or happy to have you raise your hand virtually. I think there were also, I was getting a lot of questions around FERPA and uh, the use of Zoom and recording. And I do not have a, a lawyer or legal nerd background to understand it. I've tried really hard, but I've seen in some instances, uh, professors refuse to offer Zoom classes or recordings because they think they're violating FERPA. And in other cases, they just have no idea and they might be violating FERPA. Um, so maybe Amelia, if you have suggestions, because I'm still trying to figure out you know, what role FERPA plays with the Zoom and recordings and how to keep everything safe and, and follow the, the privacy laws in that case. 
So definitely happy to point people. Um, we don't discuss in depth legal issues, but um, both are rethinking uh, video mandates, um, a short resource that FPF did with uh, the NEA, as well as the resource we did uh, with Megan um, on student privacy and special education, which sort of touched on some of these issues. Overwhelming the, overwhelmingly, FERPA is a data management statute. It's about managing records and who those records can be shared with. And so in terms of, you know, being able to record, being able to have virtual classes adopt ed tech, if the sharing is limited, if, you know, things are sufficient, um, a school doing something or an educator on behalf of a school doing something like recording a class for asynchronous learning doesn't have FERPA implications until it's shared. And that's where it starts to get a little bit trickier. Um, there's a couple of webinars that we put on um, with the California IT and Education Group back last year in, I think, March or April um, that we can send out to attendees um, that talked about some of how FERPA applies in those cases. I would just add there, because Amelia, I know we worked jointly on a piece that tackled special education specifically, but one of the main takeaways I remember from that work was also if what you're worried about people seeing is what you could see when you observe a classroom, and if your school typically allowed observations in the classroom, you probably don't have to worry too much about it. Uh, but again, it really gets back to like, what are you recording? How are you sharing it? And is it secure? Um, but I, I, I remember a lot of situations erring on the side of not being a prohibitive, right? In most cases, um, what teachers are doing in Google Classrooms and other videos is generally pretty um, allowable. Exactly. And a lot of us are dealing with random intruders like my cat um, <laughs> in our Zoom meetings and definitely um, not something that FERPA is um, meant to restrict in any way and comes down to the policy of the school in most cases. So we have a uh, question in our Q&A box. So curious about the longer term impact of video cameras capturing instruction in person. This has been suggested as a way to bring smaller student cohorts in person while other students are joining from home. Also allowing students who are absent or need to rewatch instruction to access the recorded classes. So Tori, very interested to maybe start with you here since I know a lot of professors in particular have been worrying about um, this sort of instruction. So curious what your take is. Um, yeah, this is, um, so this is thinking about recording what's happening in class. So someone who misses class is able to um, be part of class. I mean, it's something I do in my classes as I record every class. Um, I, I pause when we go to breakout rooms, I like pause so that I have a nice recording of just what I'm saying so that students can rewatch. And I've had a fair share of students who've missed classes um, who then I send to watch the video and it's actually a really easy and great. Um, at UMass, we have lecture capture software in, built into some classrooms. So it's, uh, it's relatively easy that, you know, you're, as you're talking, there's microphones and videos set up and it takes care of it. So it just does the recording for you. Um, so I think in college settings, um, if it's a lecture and that's what you're doing, that's fine. And it's hard for my students to, you know, make up classes because I have so many activities going on. I think in K-12, that's too much. <laughs> I'm worried about the high flex model of having teachers try to teach in person and online students at the same time and also be ready to teach uh, students who need to be fully asynchronous. It's basically three jobs in one and teachers already had a stressful job before. Um, so I would just say that um, it needs to be something decided in college before the semester and, and the tools and everything need to be ready to be used. But I think in K-12, um, I definitely worry about K-12 settings if it's recording the whole classroom and the students faces and interactions and then the teacher having to be worried about what's said that's not supposed to be said on camera like it's different in a K-12 classroom than like in a college online seminar um, so I would lean towards it'd be better to do in college and <laughs> I would just add class. where it's possible I think it's tremendously helpful from an accessibility standpoint right so that students could have 
can go back and watch it to have notes from it, things like that. So it's just more universally accessible for students without needing to have accommodations. Great. And Trevor, uh, since we brought in K-12 here, I want you to maybe have the last word as we tie things up. <laughs> it's actually interesting. Um, before the pandemic, uh, one of our assistant principals actually came to uh, various departments around our school and were like, hey, you know, we have kids, we have a lot of kids who are out that, um, whether it be for health issues or what, they noticed that attendance, there's a lot of issues. So they actually proposed that to us, like, how do you guys feel about us setting a camera up in your room, right? So when you're doing your lectures, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Because <laughs> part of me is like, you talk about jobs, is even when we were just going virtual this year, the amount of time I was doing recording, editing, and it was, I, I wasn't getting grading done. I was like, I was, I've had to push other things aside to be able to do those things. So I think it's like, it would have to be done on a level I don't see K through 12 implementing it. If that, you know what I mean? Like if we like this summer, if I had um, the time this summer and they told us, hey, we're doing all virtual, I could have done a lot of that on my own just because that's the type of person I am like, oh, let me film all this stuff and get my, my recordings in order. But typically how it works in my experience in my seven years, it's like, hey, we have this idea. Can you do it next week? And you're kind of like, ooh, I don't know about that. Um, cause I, I 100%, I think accessibility, especially in my district, it, things need to be more accessible. And that's why I'm excited that we have the devices and everything, but time is such a problem. If you're going to add something for me to do, you better take something away <laughs> because there's way too much going on for, for K-12 teachers right now. I can't, and I'm speaking specifically, even from a high school perspective, I think it gets even more messy as you start moving down that, that ladder to middle school and even elementary and then like even you know we have first and second graders logging in zoom still um and what i'm also worried about is in our fourth quarter here we're going to be actually offering five days a week in person but also five days a week online so my job like right now for my kids i have maybe one or two kids a day who actually come in person so my classes have pretty much just been online if i have a lot of kids i'm very worried about what's going to happen if i have 10 kids in my room but have 15 kids online because that with only one or two kids, it's easy to be like, you guys log into the computer, you're doing the same thing. But with 10 kids in person and like 15, that's going to, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm almost nervous for like how I'm going to handle that and present my lessons that I have right now. So. Great. Well, we're over time, um, but just really quick one, two word or very short one sentence answer. Um, we have a question about what situations have come up when families or students do not wanna appear on camera. So just very short, maybe start off Juliana, what is the situation we've heard about? Um, sure, absolutely. So we actually had um, a director who works with students in Connecticut who said, you know, my family is being evicted. We have boxes in the background. I understand my teachers, you know, are saying they're doing this because they care about me, but why don't they trust me? Um, you know what I mean? And, and to put it even bluntly, one quote I got was, I'm sorry, but I don't want you to see my home. Um, so again, you know, just, just those reasons for not wanting to share, you know, and have their video on. Great. Tori. Yeah, students who have to go to a local um, fast food place or somewhere to get Wi-Fi and they're in their car. Uh, my student who was in a storage closet just to join class. Uh, there's a lot of reasons of either embarrassment, worries of cyberbullying, worries of um, peers seeing things that you would not show or tell them in schools um, that have led to students not wanting to be on camera. Megan. I echo all of that. And that's also important. You know, parents are often working from home, managing the household, like home is no longer home. And so there are just situations that come up where you may want them to turn the camera off really quickly and students shouldn't get in trouble for that kind of thing. And I put additional context in the chat. Great, and Trevor. Pretty much echo the same thing. I had a lot of the same concerns. One thing I have is I have a lot of students taking care of siblings. So um, I have kids that log in from work. They'll log into Zoom from work to get their attendance check-in, listen to the directions. They'll be like, Mr. T, I'm at work. I'm like, cool, check out the directions. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, but yeah, there's just there's just so much going on. I don't, I don't see how, I personally don't see how you hold that against somebody saying, hey, I don't want to be on camera for this reason. I'm like, fantastic. As long as you're getting the work done and, and we can engage with each other and communicate, I'm all for it. Awesome. Well, I, 
again, just cannot praise enough this amazing panel and so thrilled that all of you were able to join today. Um, please thank all of our fabulous panelists and um, you can do you know your emoji reactions or whatever else you want there no need to turn on your video and uh, we will send out uh, the information the resources mentioned um, and the recording uh, in a follow-up to all of you so thank you so much for joining us today <laughs>